Okay, so this is the first game in the greatest game I've ever seen series. And this is a game between Alexander Morozovic and Vladimir Kopian. Now, it's really funny because someone earlier today was like, uh, literally in the stream or a little bit earlier was like, well, what do you think about Morozovic? And I was like, I'll answer you later. I think very highly of Morozovic. Um, uh, Morozovic was one of... Um, one of these guys that I always loved because of his creativity. And when he was on the scene, he was truly spectacular. Now, consistency is always a problem for people that are extremely creative, or, or usually it's the case. And so, you know, he got as, as high as I think number two, maybe number three in the world at one time, but he didn't stay there um, for um, indefinitely. And um, that's okay, because he brought us so many amazing, amazing games um, when was this game played? You could probably look at that um, yourself. I should maybe have looked that up beforehand, but this was played, I think, around 05 or 04, um, somewhere around there. Uh, but anyways, uh, Vladimir Kopian, for your edification, was also one of the strongest players in the world at that time, really like top 40, top 30 in the world. Twenty. Not everyone was 2,700 like they are now with inflation, so he was you know, a major boss then. And um, he actually uh, lives in the U.S. now. Um, I actually saw him at a U.S. Uh, a tour, an open tour in the U.S. very recently. Um, so he's living in the U.S., coaching in the U.S., I believe, at this time. And I believe he even switched federations a la Aronian. But um, uh, so I, I believe he is an American now. Um, anyways, uh, after this game, I'm going to show you a game analogous to this, um, which... I, I didn't play in the same brilliance as Morozovic, but, you know, uh, you might say, oh, there's some similarities. You can see where inspiration came from. So let's get this started. So D4, Knight F6, C4, E6, Knight C3, Bishop B4. So anyone know what this is called and what opening this is called? Um, you know, we'll, we're going to have some audience participation here. Uh, I'm not just going to lecture the whole time. Um, yes, the Nimzo Indian. So the Nimzo Indian is one of, uh, the most, uh, you know, popular openings at all levels and has a really, really great reputation. So much so actually that even the, the, the neural nets, most of the engines today, um, they actually prefer knight f3 instead of knight c3. Um, now, that's just a stylistic concern. I mean, it doesn't mean knight c3 is bad or anything, but um, you do see uh, a lot of white players avoiding the Nimzo because it has such a sterling reputation. Um, now, over the years, many moves have been tried. e3, knight f3, a3 is the Samish, um, bishop g5, um, G3. Um, I've, I've played a few moves myself. I, I played Knight F3, I think, mostly in my teens um, when, I, when I did allow this with white. Um, I dabble with E3 sometimes in blitz, um, but I tended not to like those positions all the time because a lot of times they transposed into IQP positions, um, and I didn't love these IQPs with white. I, I always like to play against the IQP. Um, but uh, what Morozovich played is actually uh, a line that I actually gravitated toward um, in my 20s. Um, and it's the move queen c2. And this is, uh, codifies the, the classical variation of the Nimzo. Now, it's a bit weird that you're developing your queen side uh, without do touching your king side right now. Um, but the idea with queen c2 is basically to try and get the dark squared bishop without actually spoiling your pawn structure with b takes c3. So that's kind of the intent there. And so after queen c2, d5, um, white actually plays a3. And they're trying to get that bishop pair right away without having to spoil the pawn structure. So bishop takes c3, queen takes c3 was played. And here it actually starts to get pretty interesting because um, black actually played the move... Uh, Black played the move c5, and this is actually not the most popular move at all. These days, um, black players tend to castle, and you have a ton of games, and I really mean a ton of games, that go knight f3, d takes c4, queen takes c4, and b6. And um, this line has seen a lot of... Uh, White's been trying to eke something out in these positions after bishop g5, 
queen bishop a6 and queen a4. Um, in a lot of these positions, uh, black winds up playing c5, and white is hoping that sort of the this, this split pawn structure in the end game is a real asset. So you'll see positions like, like eventually like c5, d takes c5, and like rook d1, and, and business like this going on. And um, they hope that the split pawns are an asset in the end game, and that white can eventually, you know, castle and have, be slightly better with the structure. Um, and sometimes, you know, the bishop pair asserts itself, as, as we'll, we'll, we'll see in this game and also in many other uh, Nimzos. But in this particular position, a lot of times the, the dark square bishop is nullified with some h6 and knight bd7 or h6 and g5. That was not the story of this game. And uh, you can check your openings book. Um, even in Lee Chess, they have an openings book. You can verify, validate uh, some of what I'm saying at a later point. But in this particular game, uh, Castle's not played, c5 is played. This is a very sharp move. Um, the idea with c5 is that they're trying to open the position and take advantage of White's lack of development. And so White's next move is pretty much forced. You, you kind of have to go d take c5. And because you can't really, you don't really want to recapture with the queen on d4 and have them play knight c6 with tempo. And here, black played d4. Now, I think this is actually the first opportunity to just kind of stop and, you know, think about what to do with the queen um, because there are options and um, some are better than others. Um, so I'll actually just leave it to the audience for a moment to just try and f surmise what might be the best place for the queen after d4. All right, so we have some queen g3s, we have some queen b4, we have queen c2, um, f3, no, 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 the queen is under fire, so we can't play f3. Um, um, most people are landing on g3 or c2. Um, so I think when you're kind of choosing between a few moves, one of the things you want to think about is the utility of the move so or how many things a move does i was actually um i had a lesson a little while ago with a student and i was saying you know when you're basically deciding on moves that seem similar you want to ask yourself which one does the most things and so uh if we were just play c to look at c2 and g3 um you know both queen moves basically get out of uh out of harm's way but i would say one of them does something more than just moving out the way and actually threatens something. And that's why, uh, you know, Morosevich actually played the move queen g3, because you're actually attacking g7 as well as getting out of dodge. Queen c2 is also viable, I believe. Um, but I think one of the strategic dangers here is that if black gets like a few moves, they're going to be thrilled to go knight c6, e5, a5. And if they recover the pawn back and have this dominating center, um, white's going to have a problem. Um, the other thing in some positions is you could have potentially imagine that d3 could come with a tempo um, if the knight somehow uh, can land on the d4 square. And I could see some opening up of the position where it's just devastating because, you know, white is so woefully behind development. So I think white has to kind of capitalize on gaining a tempo given in their lack in development, and that's why queen g3 makes more sense. All right, so yeah, so queen g3 hits g7, and black castled, what can be more natural than that? I say all the time on stream that the usually when castling is an opportunity, it's usually the best move in the position. And it's usually the first or second best choice of the computer as well. Um, I'm sure there will be folks here that... Uh, that will clamor about the exception to the rule, but there are always exceptions to rules in, in, in chess. There's rarely absolutes, and uh, queen g3 makes a lot of sense. Um, now, uh, I'm getting a question here. Uh, Casa, white is a pawn up. Can't he just defend? Um, does that... So, does that have something to do with not playing queen g3 and playing something else, or does that come into contradiction with... Uh, with uh, queen g3, so queen c2. So like I was just saying, 
defending this pawn is going to is going to be tricky um so just for an example let's say black plays the move a5 right now b4 is in it this might not be the best move but b4 is a hell of a lot harder now because a takes before a takes before runs into the rook hanging on a1 so you might not even get to to actually reinforce the pawn with the pawn and if that's actually the case um you're going to struggle essentially um so i'm not sure if you're able to to, to if you if you seed the c5 pawn just kind of willy-nilly you might actually have a problem there and um uh that's 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 what i would say to that so yeah so queen g3 castles usually the best move in the position and the thing that's so amazing about Morozovic and is is the energy with which he plays um it's not always correct, um, uh, but a lot of the times it is, and the energy is really amazing. And over the next, like, several, I mean, really the rest of the game, the energy that Morozovic plays with, really, I was extremely attracted to. And it begins now with bishop h6. So this is a move that, you know, obviously has a, an awesome threat, uh, checkmate, but it's really the beginning of a sequence of just being uh, like like just just crazy energy like insane energy and yeah i just it just it gets me every time so bishop h6 threatens queen takes g7 mate and black really only has one viable option um that's knight e8 um just as a a, a word why is knight h5 not so great I mean, because knight h5 does attack the queen and defend g7. Why is knight h5 not so hot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Flame, uh, flame pelt got it on the money. Yeah, queen g4, brick e4, medallion, stallion, latin and blonde. Yeah, everyone is is, is is correct about this. Queen g4 is pretty, is pretty huge, right? Like... Um, you know, you're basically attacking the knight. It can't really be defended well. Um, you play knight f6, and you're actually mated. And you're just not really holding it together. Um, and you're basically going to expose your king in, in some way, shape, or form. So knight h5 is not ideal. So knight e8 is pretty much the move that you make to defend this mate threat. But it, the funny thing about bishop h6, it seems really primitive. Because it's like, well, what's the follow-up, right? There's, it doesn't seem like there's a logical follow-up here. Um, but the move that uh, Morozovich played here was h4, and h4 is a fantastic move. Um, now, it does seem very caveman, but one of the things that's so amazing about h4 is black gave up their dark squared bishop on move four or five, right, uh, in this Nimzo position, and so the dark squares are sensitive, and this pawn in c5 also controls some dark squares. The e5 square is a little bit soft as well. There are a lot of dark squares in the position that are soft, so white is playing on the dark squares here. And the funny thing I love about this too, and, and Arch, is, Arch is mentioning it, is yeah, this is alpha zero way before anyone knew about alpha zero. Way before it was a, it was a wait, what do people say as parents of their kids? Long before you were a glimmer in the eye of, Okay, I'm, I'm bludgeoning this, uh, that, I don't even remember. Twinkle in their eye. Yeah, that's what, long before you were a twinkle in her eyes, you know. Um, but it's, it's, it's really actually, this is an attacking move, but it really has a positional justification. And I think that's the thing I want you to think about as we move through this game, because there are positional elements here. It's, it's, it's not caveman for the sake of being caveman. It's, I have control of the dark squares. I want to play on. I want to play uh, on, on that um, on that control, and my ability to create confusion there will give me an advantage. So after h4, the point is if Black does nothing really constructive, uh, the threat is to go h5. So um, you know, let's say I mean, I'm just going to make a move like a6. Let's say it's not a great move. The threat is h5, and let's let's say like let's just say for argument sake, knight c6. Uh, you could take on g7 and then go h6. And um, as we've learned from, you know, alpha zero in these neural nets, 
we've learned that the H pawn is a very, this is the way I would put it. I, 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 didn't, I didn't say this myself. I, it was described really accurately and appropriately by Matthew Sadler uh, when he said that the H pawn, uh, the Rook's pawn advances a very inexpensive way to generate an initiative. And the reason it's inexpensive is because the H pawn, it, the Rook pawns, frankly, are the weakest pawns on the board. They are, if you had to consider pawns with uh, the lowest value would be the rook pawns, right? Because if you have a rook pawn and a king and pawn in game, it's you can't win if it's just a rook pawn. Um, that being said, you also activate your rook, right? So you you do kind of multiple things without you know having to kind of with with a, at a very inexpensive rate. It's a good exchange rate, we could say. So that's kind of the threat with h4, h5. Um, and of course, this mate can be defended with like queen f6. But the point is the rook is activated, white's going to get their piece back, and the initiative continues. Okay, so after h4, black played queen, uh, knight d7, excuse me, black played knight d7. Um, I almost said black played something else. Um, black played knight d7, I was getting a little ahead of myself. And... White didn't defend the c5 pawn, and I think it's telling that white didn't do that. Um, you know, you could say, well, what about b4 trying to hold the pawn structure together? Well, it's not so much that pawn that's holding the position together. It's the, it's the, the play on the dark squares and the initiative. And if you take the time to defend this pawn, it gives black the opportunity to potentially consolidate in the center. Um, you know, I could easily see a move like king h8 actually being viable. Uh, there could be something along the lines of f6 and e5 building that center. And you're never quite sure whether you're going to hold it together because a5 could undermine the structure. Um, and, you know, with you being so woefully behind in development, it's tough to say whether you'll be able to keep it together. So, you know, whenever a5 happens, you can't go b5 because c5 is hanging and you probably need to go rook b1. And, you know, if you keep the cluster of pawns fine, but it's, it's really uncertain that you do, essentially. So that's kind of the dynamic there. So, okay. So knight d7 was played, and b4 is not the move that was played. Uh, Morozovic played h5. So we kind of get the gist of this move based upon what we were talking about before, with this inexpensive way to bring the h-pawn forward. And Akopian senses the danger. This is a 2700 grandmaster, um, very good player. I mean, they're not just going to get checkmated. And so Akopian says, you know what? We're not going <laughs> to allow, uh, allow this pressure anymore. We're going to neutralize this pressure. And Akopian played the move queen c7. Very sensible move. The knight defends the queen. It's also defending g7. Um, there's no opportunity to take on g7 now because after bishop takes g7, black would first take the queen and then recapture the bishop and just be up a piece. And so that's a no-go. So what would you do as white here uh, after queen c7? Um, this was something uh, that, you know, basically, this, this question really uh, is critical because this is kind of an inflection point in the game where it's like, are you trading queens? Are you keeping it going? How do you do this? So there's some suggestions rolling in. I'll, I'll, I'll give another 15 to 20 seconds. Um, and yeah, a lot of the moves people are saying, it's like, this is crazy. That is crazy. Um, so yeah, but it's really fascinating. I'm going to pour, pour some water. All right, so most people are landing on queen g4 or bishop f4 trying to, or, or even pawn f4 trying to keep uh, the queens on the board. Um, so, uh, or, okay, now there's a new idea of queen takes c7 and b4. Um, the problem with queen takes c7, just to address that, is the, is the bishops automatically attack. So you actually don't have time to defend your pawn. And if, again, if black recovers this pawn and there's no attack. I mean, you're going to be a bit behind development and you'll have the bishop pair, but that could be an issue. Um, if bishop f4, e5, and then bishop h6 back, as was also suggested, I'm not sure that basically white has actually managed to, to really get anything done here because now it's black's turn to move again. 
At the very least, they can step out the way and break the pin. Um, the move that was played, and uh, full credit to some of the folks in the chat that did recognize this, uh, the move that was played in this position was Rook H3. <laughs> and Rook H3, uh, frankly, I, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> like, I was kind of aghast when I saw this. I was like, what in the world is going on? And it's not so much because... Um, the thing that's kind of crazy about it, at least when you look at it at first sight, is Rook H3 allows the trade of queens. Like, there's no checkmating attack here. So how are you justified and kind of betraying the fundamental rules of development and centralization in chess to do this? And the truth of the matter is that everything that's done in this game is very much, very much has the fundamentals in mind. And that's the thing that's kind of crazy to imagine and is that you look at this position and you're saying oh white's just playing on the flank and it has nothing to do with the center and it has everything to do with the center and white has the bishop pair and i've said this over and over again on a stream that the bishop pair is amazing and this was one of the the games as a young as a young uh young up-and-comer that really kind of crystallized that for me so what does rook h3 do it keeps the bishop on h6 so that if if you, there is an intent to break the pin. The king has to go to h8. And it also keeps tension. We talk all the time about keeping tension. It's really important to keep tension. And this does do that. So rook h3 is a huge move. So black played f5. Um, and this is not a great move in my opinion, but I think it's understandable that when someone plays a move that's so shocking, you kind of lash out. Um, in various ways, but f5 is a move that is very weakening, um, and it's just not great. Now, it's understandable that you know white didn't want to, uh, black didn't want to trade the queens because if, if you take the queen and then the rook comes here, it's like, well, I haven't solved anything, and bishop takes g7 and h6 is a problem. Um, but that being said, I think if if uh, well. The problem is, too, that there aren't many good moves. So uh, the move that I was going to suggest that kind of looks natural is king h8. But king h8 fails. Uh, why does king h8 not work? Thank you for the raid, Kaylin, 2006. Yeah, yeah, it, it removed the defender, right? Exactly. So... So, so bishop takes g7 just becomes a huge issue because now it's a check. And because it's a check, there's no time to trade the queens here before you take the bishop. And the knight is simply overloaded. So if knight g7, queen takes c7 is a huge problem. So basically, king h8 doesn't work. Um, playing a move like g6 just loses the exchange on f8. And so you start to, and then again, there's this threat of bishop g7 and h6. So you start to look at moves and you're like, well, I don't know what the options are. They all look kind of rough. But even so, f5 is not the one I would have made. Um, um, now, it's it's hard to be super critical, but I think looking at this now, um, I would have probably taken and gone king h8 in this way. And at least now the queen is not... Um, the knight is not overloaded to the queen on c7 and the pawn on g7, so the bishop indeed has to move. And if black was able to set up some uh, some dark square uh, pawn chain in the center to restrict the dark squared bishop, there may be some reasonable uh, play here for black, given the the uniqueness of uh, of white's development scheme. So, uh, but again, white would have the two bishops there as well. F5. Uh, let's again address F5 for the third or fourth time already. It's weakening. What specifically does it weaken? Well, it weakens, I always say when you push pawns, well, when you move any piece, frankly, you're moving it away from squares it was previously defending. And uh, it's all the more important with pawns because this is not checkers and they can't go backwards. And so whenever you move a pawn once, you're weakening uh two squares. So it, it's always the squares adjacent. So if this pawn, let's just say uh, the pawn on b2 moved once to b3, you'd weaken a3 and c3. Now when a pawn moves twice, two squares, you actually weaken four squares. So 
F5 weakens E6, G6, G5, and E5. And not all weaknesses created are equal. The main issues here, or most salient issues here, the E5 and G5 squares, um, specifically because black does not have a dark squared bishop. So that's the thing to, to really consider uh, when you're thinking about pawn moves. That's a huge, huge thing. And the thing with weaknesses is you might not be able to take advantage of them right away. You might not ever be able to take advantage of them, but that's something you need to keep in mind when you're making decisions. You have to be really judicious about what you're willing to give up. I mean, chess is a game of give and take uh, to a certain extent. Whenever you move a piece, you're weakening squares almost every time. There's a very few examples. Like if a bishop is on A1 and it moves to B2, it didn't weaken any squares uh, because there were no other squares it was controlling. But in most cases, it's happening. So it's important to keep that dynamic in mind. Okay, so F5, uh, queen takes C7 was played. I think that's one of the, also the stunners here. As you look at this and you're saying, well, white is playing for some attack on the uh, on the G file, right? This H4, H5, rook H3, this caveman style. Well, actually, that was just an opportunity to basically move to another position uh, and, and basically transform your advantage somewhere else. So white got what they wanted out of this. Morozovic got weakened dark squares and a bishop pair. Now he's going to go to work. So queen takes e7, knight takes e7, the bishop has to move, bishop g5. Okay, you see immediately the impact of this f5 move, right? You can't play f6. And now knight takes e5 isn't a move. Because after knight takes c5, you have bishop e7, right? So it's already kind of showing how this f5 move kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. So black played e5 here, uh, at least kind of solidifying the center to a certain extent. But is that center so solid? We would love, black would love this pawn to be back on f6, but it's not there. And so... Uh, Morozovich is like, all right, well, let me install my bishop on this nice square. Bishop e7, hitting the rook on f8. And after rook e8, bishop d6, another tempo. So temp, tempo, tempo, defend the pawn. Now white has a bishop pair and a pawn. That's a pretty big deal. In positions that were kind of less irregular, a bishop pair and a pawn up is a winning position, uh, all things considered. So black has to basically shift the dynamic in some way or it's going to just be over. Um, that's amazing. Looking at, you know, black's perceived central control, perceived safer king, that that's the case. But that's the case. All right, so 96, hitting the c5 pawn. What does white do here? Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So the, some answers are rolling in. We have, I'm just going to read some stuff from the chat. We have rook g3, b4, knight f3, h6. All very interesting moves. Um... I think, again, just to kind of rule out b4, it is a move, but when you play b4, you do give black the opportunity to activate their rook. And so if b4 is played, a5 could be annoying. Now, a takes b4 is a threat, and you can't recapture with the rook on a1, so you'd have to get the rook out of dodge. And I think Morozovic may have evaluated that allowing the rook this potential open file might not be worth holding the pawn. I'm actually not 100% sure about this. And um, in these in these uh, these games, we're going to refrain from from uh, from messing with the engine here and try to understand these positions um, on our own. Um, but I think that's one of the things that um, that kind of held Rosevich back here. Because if you hold on to the pawn and you get to the end game, this obviously this cluster is awesome. But it's going to take some time to do there, and you, you basically help the rook 
develop without moving. Again, it's kind of funny, a very inexpensive way to activate your rook, right? The rook's pawn um, advancing. So uh, very, very uh, thematic. We saw it on the king side. Now we're analyzing it on the queen side. Um, the move that was played was rook d1. And this is, again, a perfect example of going from one advantage to the next. So the pawn here on c5 is being offered. It's saying, look, you can have the pawn. We're going to have material um, equal material, but I'm going to transform the position in another way. Um, we already have seen Morozovich go from bishop pair, right, right out of the opening, to king side initiative, to queen side trade at trying to hold the pawn. Now we're giving up the pawn. And after knight takes c5, white played f4. I love this move. I love this move. Basically with f4, you see just how fragile the, the black center is because all of a sudden it's just collapsing. Um, if the e-pawn moves, the d-pawn hangs and the knights here aren't that great. Um, the knight on d7 can't move because the knight on c5 drops. And the knight on c5 is, eh, it's not so great either. And so it's just an, a beautiful undermining of the center. And all of a sudden these rooks here look kind of cool. Like they're kind of doing a job. This rook is covering along the third rank. This thing, this, the center's undermined. Just beautiful. So after f4, the thing that's so counterintuitive about f4 is that your king is basically in the line of fire of the rook. But because the queens are off the board, the king is actually relatively safe. And I think this is something that also just for the people out there that, you know, are basically um, uh, may, maybe not so experienced. When the, ki when the queens come off the board, your king is much safer and you can be more judicious about whether you need to castle or not if you haven't already. Now, I always say castle at the soonest opportunity um, just because it's it's a way in which you can reliably get into the game without having something go horribly wrong. But um, you'll see rule breaking happen. And it's important that when you see the rule breaking, you don't just take it and you know run with it. You understand what the justification for the rule breaking is. Um, and that's something that's really important to notice is why did they feel justified in making that decision? And the point is that white actually has more pieces on in the middle than black. I mean, right? Like the knight and the bishop haven't developed yet, but the rooks are here. The bishop is here. And if you just look at the pieces around the king, there are way more defenders around this king than there are potential attackers that black has. And so you do that calculus and you're able to kind of justify what you're doing. All right, so after f4, e takes f4 is played, um, at least focusing the rook on the e2 pawn. And what now? Um, you have plenty of very interesting options, right? The center is broken, and you, you have the opportunity to kind of, um, uh, kind of take advantage in a few different ways. And it's really instructive to see how Morozovich actually took advantage here. So I'll actually give 30 seconds here. I'll take some more water. I've got a large Brita water filter here. I'm going to drink a lot of water tonight. All right, so we have some really good chess players here. I mean, it, it must be said, the suggestions are really legit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see. Um, so uh, most people are saying knight f3 in chat, um, trying to develop a piece and keeping the pawns where they are. That is really brilliant. Um, and, um, you know, rook takes d4 is also legit. Um, Excuse me. Hold on. Yep. Had a little burp there. Um, and it's just, it's really, really, I think, there, it's instructive that there are a lot of options, right? You can see that the, the center's collapsed, so there's a lot of ways you can slice it. Um, I really like the knight f3 idea, just because you develop a piece and attack a pawn. But actually, Morozovich sees a way that they can, he can extract a little bit more before he does that. 
Um, I think, let me, actually, did he start with knight f3 here? There, I always mix up this moment because this transition is, is really beautiful. But yeah, okay, he does start with knight f3. Yeah, knight f3 is really awesome. And uh, I always mix up this move and the next move um, for, for obvious uh, reasons, as you'll see, because it's like, what is the right way to handle it? But the thing about knight f3 that's so awesome is you get another piece into the game and you continue with more energy. And um, it's funny because Latinum Blonde, you're saying, well, what about d3? What about d3 is in response to knight f3? Well, d3 was played. Um, and so kudos to you for finding the response that you think is most agitating. Um, I think that's really important when you're analyzing these positions. But now it's very important to notice that white actually has more control of the center here than black. The bishop and the rook are at home but they're also not really asserting themselves in the center. Um, the, the bishop on f1 is actually playing some role here, at least defending e2. And if you look at the control in the center, white's pieces are doing a much better job here. And so when this d-pawn goes away, you're actually kind of thrilled with that development as white because it means you have a rook that's also manning an open file and it means things are really happening. And so Mrozovic is like, well, okay, play d3, op open the lines up even more, I'm going to extract an advantage somewhere else. And he plays the move h6. And it's just like, dude, like what a boss. So it's like, you know what, you can play d takes e2 and, you know, bishop takes e2, whatever. I'm now going to have lines against your king, even with the queens off the board, because I have the bishop pair and because you're playing, you know, you've played e5 and d4, I'm about to have an open position. That's going to spell trouble all the way around. And so the funny thing about this is that you play g takes h6, and my god, like these, first of all, these pawns are sitting ducks. But second of all, the king is not safe. The king is just not safe. Um, I mean, rook takes h6, maybe some knight g5, bishop takes everything's collapsing, basically. And white has the healthy structure and the two bishops. Um, so, crazy. So, after h6, Akobian played g6, but now, I mean, as we've learned with the neural nets, I mean, hello, look at the weaknesses here. And it's just so funny how this king, which, you know, seemed to be safer than the white king, now starts to really feel the pressure after the move knight g5. And look at that. Black's king has back rank problems. Black's king can't get off the eighth rank. Um, that is disastrous. And the rook now, which was kind of doing something on the H file, now has the opportunity to swing across the third rank to kind of assert itself that way. And so it's really just, I mean, just, well, just, just, just beautiful. I mean, I, I, I just, I can't get over it. I, I really can't get over it. So after eight, knight g5, black actually played knight e4. It's like, you know what? I actually have to clear some cobwebs here because if I don't, um, the center, you know, all, all white's pieces are coming to life. So playing a move like, um, playing a move like d takes e2, bishop takes e2, well, work, I mean, look at this. Every white piece is developed. How could you have possibly imagined that looking at the position from move, you know, 10, it seemed like there's just only white's queen that was developed. And there was just, there was positional outclassing that happened here. Um, but there was a fundamental understanding about positional play. It wasn't like Morozovic was trying to checkmate. That was not the intent at all. He was creating confusion on the flank to influence play in the center. Okay. So instead, knight e4 is played. And these two pieces are attacked. Uh, so bishop takes f4. You, of course, you keep the bishop. And then d takes e2. Bishop takes e2. Knight takes g5. Bishop takes g5. And the dust is settled. I mean, it's, I think, everyone and their, and their grandma would say white is better here, right? The material's equal. White has the two bishops. White has a safer king. White has a much more attractive majority to uh, on the queen side um, uh, that's easier to mobilize. Black's majority is extremely uh, inflexible. And because of that, white is just dominant. 
But the game is not over yet. And again, there's another transition now that happens that really the the um, the neural nets, the the modern computers have kind of demonstrated recently um, that uh, that kind of has helped change our understanding. But I think it's pretty cool that Morozovich had this understanding before we 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 got these new these new funny fun toys to work with. And what he realizes he can actually convert his advantage or transform his advantage again. And so after knight c5, rookie threw his plane. Excellent move. We see this all the time now where you trade your your opponent's active pieces away and leave them with passive pieces and they're just losing. Um, this was not as as clearly crystallized before I out the zero, I would say. It was something we kind of generally understood, but it's amazing how brutally direct it is. Why does rook take c3 not work? Well, it doesn't work because of rook d8 check, intermediate move. And the point is then after king f7, bishop takes e3, it's a wrap. The knight is under fire, the bishop can't move because of the pin, and white is ready to go rook h8 and capitalize on the h-pawn that shuffled up the board all those moves ago. And so there's no opportunity for white to actually trade on, or for black to trade on e3. So after rook e3, Knight e4 is played, and this is a pin, so white played bishop f3, and black played king f7, and here Morozovich played bishop h4, just keeping the tension. Really nice move here. Again, when you have the ability to keep the tension, do so. Um, there's no need to trade just yet. Um, there's real pressure here. And, you know, just, just, just keep the tension. It's a, it's a very, very nice way to kind of, you know, keep the position going. Bishop e6 was played now. And here actually is kind of a, a crisis, if you will, because black is now getting some counterplay. The king is not suffering from back rank problems at the moment. And, um, you know, black is starting to get active. Maybe the majority is getting attacked. So Morozovich has to make some concrete decisions here about how to kind of play this position. And he starts with the move rook d4. I think that's a, a very not obvious move. I think a lot of people would have played b3 here and just defended the pawn like this. Rook d4 is really strong because you attack the knight once again, which means that you have the option of taking on e4 and not walking into a pin. Whereas if you played bishop eight takes e4 in this circumstance, there could have been some counterplay on the e file after like f e4 and bishop c4 or something along those lines, or or maybe even bishop takes c4 right away after f takes e4. Yeah, that's actually that's actually the move because bishop d5 check just runs into bishop takes d5 and the rook is still hanging, so you can't actually take the the bishop on d5 back. So these these little tactical dynamic here that makes rook d4 pretty important because now you defend and have the threat. So rook d4, rook c8, b3, a5. Black is trying to get somewhere here and it's critically important that bishop takes e4 is played. And it's it's funny because you you, you play this type of position and it seems like what the heck are you doing giving up the bishop pair? We, we've sung the praises of the bishop pair uh, for the majority of this game, and then you just give it up like that? Why? Why did you give it up? And the funny thing is, it's not with the intent to win the pawn right away. Because if f takes e4 happens, and then white plays rook takes e4, we might be able to get, uh, black might be able to get some trades in. Um, uh, something along the lines of like uh, bishop f5, maybe, um, or maybe even bishop d7, one, one of these moves. And there might be the possibility of the rooks all coming off the board. Now, rook e7 is a move here, but what I want to illustrate is that if we have some captures like this and all the rooks come off, this opposite colored bishop endgame is uh, not trivial at all um, to win. And it's, it's basically going to be a draw. And, and the reason it's going to be a draw is because black and us ultimately just sit and obstruct the path of the last pawn that white has after they create a passed pawn. 
And in some circumstances, to hold the king side together, they can even sack a pawn with g5 so that the bishop is tied to the diagonal. Because one of the issues here is if the king winds up getting to g7 and the bishop is on g5, you wouldn't have any opportunity to defend the h7 pawn because this diagonal would be the shortest diagonal in the game for the light squared bishop to defend that pawn. So actually there's sometimes you sack a pawn so that you keep the, lo the diagonal long enough to defend and you can kind of cover. Um, uh, you can use your bishop and a pawn to cover too. Just to illustrate that, I'm just going to make a few moves. So let's say king d2, g5 takes something along these lines. Let's say I'm just trying to illustrate. Um, let's say, again, this didn't happen at all, but just trying to show you guys what could happen. Again, not making the best moves here. But this is basically the point. Like, this position is a dead draw. And the reason it's a dead draw is because you can't break through on the king on the on the king side, and black essentially just obstructs on the queen side. And so this is the kind of thing you'd want to avoid. And this is why you know some people, um, you know, mistakenly think that a lot all opposite colored bishop end games are drawn because of this kind of dynamic. Um, but it's not really the case, um, and usually it's not the case because. As long as there are heavy pieces on the board, rooks or queens, that dynamic is not really present. Which means that like white can kind of extract more of the position before trading everything. So the reason, so after bishop takes f e4, f takes e4, instead of taking the pawn on e4, white plays a4. And this is massive. And the point is, is that this e4 pawn is a weakness, but in truth, black would actually rather have it gone because then the rooks would be active. And so by going a4, the brilliant thing about it is black's rooks have no open files. This bishop on h4 does a masterful job of covering d8, and there's just no other file to work with, especially with the e pawn being blocked. And so what you do in these positions where you have obstacle at bishops and you might have a space advantage or whatever is you basically begin to f basically limit their options before you actually do stuff. And with a4, white is fixing black's queenside structure. The kingside structure is already fixed, more or less. And that's just masterful end game play. So after a4, bishop f5 is played covering the pawn, and white went rook d5. And now all of a sudden it plays shifts from being forget about the e pawn. The queen side is soft, so we're going to massage that. Black went b6 to defend the b pawn, and then rook d6 happened, and there's a new problem, uh, the b6 pawn. And there's no opportunity to defend b6 with rook e6 because what? Why, does, why is rook e6 not a great move for folks out there that I haven't asked a question in a while? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is saying this rook d7. And um, the king goes, you have to deal with the h7 pawn. If the king goes to g8, uh, can I interest you in rook g7? <laughs> the king then goes to h8, and this is just not going to end well. I mean, it's just not going to end well. This king is in a bad way. Now, if the bishop somehow migrates to this, uh, excuse me, the dark square bishop migrates to this diagonal, it's a wrap. So, um, Anyone have any fun way for the bishop to get to the the uh, this diagonal? There, there are a few really, really awesome ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're uh, pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. I, I, I mean, the energy you, you got, you all are pretty strong. Um, I love this king e two, bishop e one, bishop c three dynamic. I love it. I love it. Um, I maybe would have put the king on a on a um, on. I wanted to put the king on a dark square, but then it's just in the way. So I actually would go king e two. And again, once this bishop gets here, uh, it's windmill time, um, and it's just a wrap. And so you could see very clearly how the structure just collapses. It just completely collapses with the with the king being here like that. Um, so yeah, all right. So basically, because rook d7 is a huge problem, black has to go rook d8. 
Um, active rook, passive rook. That's the, the real difference here. Um, oh, we have a question. Let me go back momentarily. Um, what about, so we're talking about this position, and what about bishop g4 check? Yeah, this move annoyed me. I mean, this is why I wanted to have it on a dark square. I, I probably would have gone king d2 and been patient because I'm still holding the d file. So I'm not so concerned about um, this rook activating. I mean, you do have rook d6 check, but the point is as soon as this bishop gets to this diagonal, it's over. So even a move like rook d3 doesn't save anything. Um, white can just take and go bishop f6 and it's, oops, whoa takes on d3 at the pawn and go bishop f6 and it's over this is like already mate and one there and uh yeah rook f8 doesn't really change change that much um a move like bishop e5 bishop d4 or even rook takes g6 for that matter just wins the game on the spot winning an exchange so yeah, there's a check there. Um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, you do have to figure out kind of what's the cleanest way to get the bishop to the diagonal, but the boots on the ground doesn't really change. Um, uh, there are fixed weaknesses and a king in the doghouse. Um, that's a problem. All right, so rook d6, rook b8, king d2. Again, shifting this king over. There's no contesting of the open file. Rook b7. King c3, and this the king is nicely tucked here. Also, very subtly, it's closer to these weak queenside pawns, and so that makes that makes a big difference as well um, as White is trying to break through. And um, this game ended in just a few moves. Um, rook e6 was played, trying to contest the rook. Rook d8, no thank you. Uh, this rook is super active. Uh, no need to trade it for a passive piece. Now rook h8 is also a big threat. So g5 was played, just trying to shed a pawn to kind of keep the keep this pawn, stay connected to this pawn. As we mentioned, that's a dynamic in in some of these opposite colored bishop endgames. But with rooks on the board, heavy piece on the board, this is never going to be a real solution. So bishop takes g5, rook g6 was played, and just rook g3, just defending the bishop. And it, it's kind of cool because you look, you think, oh, rook g3, now the e-pawn is free to go. But the, the king is just so weak here that there's just not a whole lot of counterplay. And after e3, how would you handle this position? Because it looks like all of a sudden white is allowed, uh, white is actually allowed black a little bit of counterplay. And, you, and this is, I think, one of the moments where you'd be like, oh no, I didn't keep everything under control. There's, there's some activity here, but it's really phantom activity. So you got to be a little careful. Um, a move like rook f3 might run into rook takes g5, uh, hanging the bishop, and we don't want that. Um, rook h8. Yeah, that might, that might be a possibility. That could be a possibility. That's a, that's a good idea. Good idea. Um, yeah, white played rook d5. Just challenging this bishop. A lot of times when a pawn is close to queening, you do want to kind of get it under control. And the king couldn't approach. So the next best thing is the rook. And rooks love to be behind pawns. And so I think I was surprised no one said rook d1 coming back. And rook d1, you know, does actually stop the pawn from queening. But the reason rook d5 is so strong is because you attack the bishop with check. So there's no time for e2. And then after bishop b6... Rook f3 uh, seals it um, because basically now <laughs> this king is just basically in a vice grip of its own making, frankly, with these light pieces blocking it and the dark squares just corrupting them. And even if rook f3 wasn't a move, rook e5, what I was really what I was going to illustrate is that rook e5 essentially um, picks up the pawn no problem. And black, be black being down two pawns with a host of weaknesses on the queen side and a weak king is, is a win every day, uh, especially with the rooks on the board. It would actually be a, a very easy win with the rooks off because of bishop d8 collecting the queen side pawns, but the rooks on, it's just very easy. It just so happens that after bishop b6, there's a t actually a tactical solution with rook f3. 
And as a consequence of that tactile solution, Black actually resigned. Now, I don't know about you, but that is one of the greatest games I've ever seen. And it's not on anyone's list. I don't think it you know, made a major dent for a lot of uh, people. But the reason why it's impactful to me is because of the, the power of the bishop pair, the creativity through the, the opening and the middle game, and the constant transformation of advantages. And so it's just, it, it's just something that gets me every time, and it really is remarkable for me. And I'm going to show you an example of something I did similar. Um, so, but before we uh, get to the example of what I did similar... Let's just recap. So I'm just going to back all the way up and we can just very briefly summarize. So, okay. So we have this classical Nimzo. We have uh, unusual uh, gambit with C5 and D4. Uh, White's behind development but has dark squares and takes full advantage. Initially, there's an attack. It transforms to a, an end game or end, a middle game rather, a queenless middle game with the trade of queens. And now, instead of it being, um, well, I just said, instead of being attack, it's a queenless mill game with a, a, a trade of queens. And the bishop redeploys itself to take advantage of the dark squares. So then the dark squares become soft. White sheds a pawn to activate the pieces and make up for their lack of development and creates a host of weaknesses in the process. And very alpha zero style weakens the king in the long term. Um, all of a sudden, white is the one that has a lead in development and the two bishops. Crazy. Then, after that, white elects to actually give up the bishop pair to transform the position to one where they're active rooks versus passive rooks in an opposite colored bishop position where uh, because white has more space, um, black's pawns on the dark squares are weaker than white's pawns on the light square. So both both sides have pawns on the on the op on the same color as their opponent's bishop, but this the dynamic of the space advantage on the queen side means that white's pawns aren't actually really targets and black's pawns are. Um, then black kind of in vain tries to defend and get some activity, but white had it in control the whole time and just maneuvers, maneuvers, and then tactically um, finish the finishes the game off and it's just a stunner. So, okay, let me see here. There's a question. Can you go back a couple of moves? Can black try rook e8 instead of f5 and try to force a rook trade? Um, let me see. Let me, instead of f5. So, are you talking about at the beginning? Uh, what part are you talking about? Um... I'm 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 very confused. I'm very confused because there's there's not. I meant g5. I think that's not that. I, I need more clarity. Uh, can Black try rook e8 instead of g5? Okay, so instead of g5. So let's see where g5 happened. Okay, so can Black try rook e8 instead of g5? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, the reason rook e8 can't be played instead of g5, or it's not particularly effective is because after rook takes e8, king takes e8, g4 picks up the e4 pawn and keeps the initiative going. Um, bishop takes g4 is impossible because rook takes e4 check, right? So because of that, the bishop has to, um, whoops, because of that, the bishop has to back up. It has to go to e6 or d7, probably e6. And after rook takes d4, um, again, with, with one pair of rooks on the board this is winning every day of the week and twice on Sundays because black can eat oh, excuse me white can very easily hone in on the b6 square so now the play would shift to going like bishop f2 rook e5 rook b5 and the pawn will drop at some point um, and you have to also worry about the h7 pawn so that's why uh why rook e8 doesn't hold up in my opinion there might be a, a even an even more convenient way to win the game, but that but rookie eight and G it takes and G four is, is sufficient enough. Okay, so I am now gonna show you a game that had some shades of 
of this Morozovich game, and particularly the end game component. And it's funny because this was played after. I'm pretty confident this was played after the game, after the Morozovich game. The game I'm I'm finding here is in 09 that I'm played um, when I was a 2100, and I was you know very new in my understanding of a bishop pair, but um, but I thought that this game really helped me. The, the Mrozovich game, rather, had really helped me under, uh, understand how I can work through a position. So I'm not going to go over the whole game here, um, but I'm going to show you the moments where I thought it was analogous. So I was white here, and I played e4, and we had a French, so I got a bishop pair kind of quick. Um, this was the this is the Armenian line of the winner. It's a very unusual line. Um, and I don't, I I'm, I didn't, I don't think I played the opening particularly well. But I just want to show you a moment later on. I, I, I was trying to be creative here. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, Rook G1, <laughs> Rook G1 and G4. This was my my vibes then. I think it's wholly unnecessary. I probably should have just castled. Um, but you know, again, this is uh, these were the vibes at the time, um, and. Uh, Okay, f6, g4, I thought I was really clever, just kind of full steam ahead. And we got to a position after queen takes e5, queen takes e5, and knight takes e5, where I felt my position kind of slipping away. And I was frustrated because, I mean, this was like a, a 23-30 fide player. Um, and I was like, man, I thought I had this nice attack, and I've traded queens, and... You know, this was not exactly how it was supposed to go, but I have bishops. I do have an active position here, and I was like, how do I keep the game, how, how do I keep the initiative going? Because black is threatening to win an exchange with knight f3 check, and they're threatening uh, knight takes d3, essentially ridding myself of the bishop here, and maybe the c-pawn becomes a problem. And I was very proud of my play the rest of the game. Um, there could There are probably some flaws with it, um, I've not deeply analyzed it, but I was very proud of the way I handled it. You're going to see some similarities here. So I started with the move f6. <laughs> I actually was like, take my exchange on f3. I'm cool with that because I thought if knight f3 check, king e2, knight takes g1, rook takes g1, I thought, man, this is really good energy for uh, with the bishops here and the rook for uh, the exchange down, I thought, man, this is really crazy, crazy pressure for uh, black to deal with. So black didn't go knight f3. They went knight takes d3. And this is actually what I expected. And I played c takes d3, and I still have this pressure on g7, but they have this kind of annoying move g6. And the point is with g6, they're saying, you know what, if you take on g6, I'm going to play king f7, I'm going to attack your rook and then take on f6, and I'm going to essentially wriggle out and, you know, even have the better pawn structure. And I thought the way I handled this was actually pretty cool. Uh, does anyone want to take a stab? I mean, this is, these are very similar to the way that of the, the Morozovich game. Anyone want to take a stab at what I, I played? Yeah, so everyone is saying bishop e7, redeploying the dark square bishop. We're getting king e2, rook g5, or bishop e7 seems okay. Uh, <laughs> king e2, pong cloud. <laughs> um, f4. So the move that I played, I thought activity here was critical. And one of the things that I was thinking is my bishop on a3, an obstacle of bishops, bishops, you always want to think about your bishop's activity versus their bishop's activity. And I was really keen on it. I was thinking about Morozovich game, right? And I played the move bishop d6. And I was so proud of this move. Because I thought if I get this bishop on this diagonal, in particular on the e5 square, my bishop is a beast. And I can collect all the pawns. And their bishop on c8 is, what, staying behind its own pawns. So I wanted to blockade their pawns and then just collect. And I thought that was... That was the way to handle it. 
And so after bishop d6, they actually played e5. They're like, no, 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 we can't, we can't deal with that because if king f7, right, I'm going to go bishop e5, and what are you going to do? I'm going to collect. I, I mean, I'm probably go rook c1, try to collect with the rook instead. And um, black, white, again, the difference in bishops is pretty extraordinary, and I have the strongest pawn on the board. And so uh, black played e5. I thought that was reasonable at the time, but I took on e5. They played bishop f5 now. I thought that was a very smart move, willing to give up the exchange to actually get some activity um, because the, they, they do have activity here. But I, I wasn't really vibing with that exchange. I mean, again, I was in Morozovich mode here. Excuse me, I did, I, know, I did not queenside castle. I just played the move of bishop takes c3. And I said, look, we're gonna have an even pawn position potentially, but the activity is gonna be the difference. And so, they actually played rook h7. They're like, you know what? I mean, maybe an f7 check is not a problem now. And I went king d2. And then after rook c8, I went bishop d4. And I just want to point out here that this bishop is basically on a lovely outpost. Minor pieces between uh, between pawns are usually very elegant, especially when it's an enemy. Pawn. It's between a friendly pawn and enemy pawn. It's like the perfect outpost if there are no pawns. On the, on the adjacent files. It cannot be harassed. And so all of a sudden, I have this massive, massive bishop um, that can't be challenged. And uh, I, I've, I have not had many um, minor piece outposts like this in my life, I must say. <laughs> um, so, and, and there's really not a lot of counterplay for them. And they constantly have to worry about this f6 pawn. And then basically from here, it's just about improving your position. And so, a la Morozovich, Rook c7, threatening rook c2. How do you think white should parry rook c2? Rook c1 trades all the rooks. Remember, it's critically important in these end games that you do maintain a heavy piece. Maintain a heavy piece. So um, rook a2 is the solution. You just cover. No counterplay. There's no invasion squares on my side of the board that they can get through. And you just cover. And then they went a6. Okay, defending the a pawn creates actually another backwards weakness. And I went rook b2. Just go with the rook. And then rook e8. f4. Taking more space. Rook f7. Bishop e5. And they're just, they have no activity, nothing to do. Uh, I don't need a, uh, I don't need a, I don't need, uh, I just need to play a position where I don't give up my rooks. Because again, you need the, you need the rook to extract more from the position. If you trade both of the rooks, a lot of times that's when the opposite colored bishop's positions can be drawn if the king gets the center really quickly. So you need to extract more before you give it up. I actually wind up giving up my both my rooks at the right moment. And so you'll see that in a second. So I went, I, they went rook d8. I went rook b4, just stopping d4, just keeping, keeping everything under control. They went king h7. I went h4. <laughs> Again, just locking things up. King f g8, king e3. Now, it must be said, black has been a little cooperative. They haven't done anything constructive. And after king f8, king d4. And now my king now is perfectly secure in between the pawns like the bishop was. And black has just been shuffling. And look at the buildup that white has had. Um, it's even the same color complex, actually, uh, or the same piece dynamic as the Morozovich game, where I have a dark squared bishop in the opposite colored bishop position with rooks, just like the Morozovich game, right? It was dark square bishop here with the rooks, dark square bishop here with the rooks, and they have a light square bishop. And then king g8, rook b1, <laughs> correct? And now the problem is, is you, you can go rook d7 and and very temporarily hold on to um, to the b7 pawn, but this is not going to go, This you're not going to save this. Um, I'd probably go rook b6 here just to encroach further and then maybe rook c1 next, um, but you're not going to hold this. They played bishop d7, I took on b7, 
and they took on a4 that was the big idea to trade pawns but again it's it's not working anymore and after rook x f7 king takes f7 rook b7 rook d7 i realized that i'd actually extracted enough to trade if i if if i needed to do more here before trading i could have gone rook b8 shifted the rook over to h8 and create more trouble in various ways, maybe f5 and try to get the h pawn. But I realized here that actually this is enough. And after rook takes b7, bishop takes d7, and king takes d5, it's really hard for the king to contest both the, the d pawn and the f pawn, and also hold on to the a pawn, which could be a problem. And so black's position is just lost. So bishop a4, d4, King e6, king d6, bishop e3, king d5, king f7, king c6, d6. And the point is when you have the pawns on d6 and f6, the bishop or the king is going to have to give on one of the pawn pushes. And so after bishop e5, king c7, king e6, I went f7 and black ultimately resigned because after king takes f7, d7, one of the pawns goes through. Um... But I think the, the point is the same. Like you, 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 you get this position where you have this, these obstacled bishops with, the, with the, the rooks and it becomes about activity and control. And I thought at least the end game component was very analogous to the Mrozovic game. I think the middle game component also had its similar similarities. I, just, I've, I was not a good attacker at the time and I'm still not an amazing attacker at times. Um, I think rook g1 was probably unnecessary. Uh, I could have castled here and probably had a great position. Um, but um, that being said, um, I tried to spice it up a la Morozovic and managed to acquit myself in the end game. And I think getting the bishop to the, the right diagonal, making sure it's the better bishop was, uh, was the way that um, it kind of uh, sealed the deal. So, yeah. Um, that I, th I don't think we're gonna. Ha I'm not gonna have games that always match or analogous to uh, the greatest games, the uh, the greatest games section. But I thought in this particular example, I, I just I really thought about it when I found this game. I was like, oh yeah, I remember I did something similar um, because you know you see great games and it inspires you, and so um, hopefully this inspired you in some way, shape, or form. Um, where exactly did black go wrong? I, I mean, I think frankly, the, the, this Armenian variation, although we probably didn't play it correctly, doesn't have a great reputation because the king is going to f8 and the rook is not great here. The rooks rarely get connected. And frankly, winnowers where the kings go to f8 are always very shaky. Um, um, they're, they're, the winnowers where the, the king has gone to f8 have been played for, you know, decades um, but they're, the neural nets really hate them. Um, they're really, they're just shaky positions. Um, and you know, you can get, you can activate the rook with h5, h4 at times, but, um, I, I, it's not for the faint of heart. Let's put it like that. So yeah, uh, that was that. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, I will, um, stop the recording component now and I'll actually take some feedback, but I really appreciate everyone that, uh, um, that checked this out and, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool.